Hello and welcome. Before I introduce my guest, Professor Mona Baker uh, from the University of Manchester, I'd first like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Morven beaton tomey and I'm a lecturer in Interpreting and Translation Studies, also at the Centre for Translation and Intercultural Studies at the University of Manchester. Mona, I'd like to talk to you today about the second edition of In Other Words. Um, I think that you yourself really need no introduction. You're uh, a prominent figure in the field of translation Thank studies, uh, to mention a, a few of your publications, critical readings in translation studies, the Routledge Encyclopedia of Translation Studies, the four volume uh, translation studies, and of course your monograph, Translation and Conflict. Um, Second edition of In Other Words, um, what prompted you to bring out another edition of the 1992 book? Well, the, the, the first edition, as you know, came out in 1992, so that's nearly 10 years ago. Um, it's a long time in the life of a discipline. Um, uh, much has changed during that period. Uh, for a start, we weren't a discipline in mm. 1992. I remember when I, um, back in the late 80s, when I wanted to do an MA in translation studies, I couldn't find mm. one within reach. Today, uh, just about every institution around the world uh, has several, offers several uh, different MAs in translation and interpreting. So today we are a discipline, um, and that's a major change. Uh, it changes uh, a lot of the ways in which we think about what we do, and it changes our level of accountability, and it changes the level of uh, resources that are needed for, uh, mm -hmm. for, for servicing a large number of students. And so encouraged by, um, by the uh, uh, by Routledge, by the publisher, um, I decided to revisit what I did 10 years ago and to try and bring it more in line with what was happening today, both in the discipline and also in the professional world of translation and interpreting. Um, if we could just focus in on those changes, um, you talked about a number of changes that have happened in the discipline and in the professional practice mm. of translation and interpreting. Mm. Um, could you maybe mention a few of those uh, that we could explore in a little more detail? Yeah. As far as the discipline is concerned, as I already mentioned, there are just far more training courses than there used to be. Um, and so this, this is a major change. In terms of the professional uh, world itself, and of course that is reflected in the kind of courses that are on offer, um, there is, for example, the shift towards uh, relying more heavily on visual material mm -hmm. and integrating visual and uh, and verbal material in uh, things like um, newspaper material, promotional leaflets, um, the growth of audiovisual translation. Uh, today we are very much a visual culture and we the visual element uh, is almost always there. You never, you hardly ever now uh, translate uh, purely verbal stretches of text. There's always some, mm -hmm. verbal, uh, some visual element that you have to take on board. For example, a lot of translators now translate web pages, which are very dynamic, which have moving pictures, which sometimes also have sound. Uh, and of course, the changes in technology as well have uh, supported this mm. kind of shift. Mm. Uh, and translators have to be far more versatile than they used to be in taking on board not just the, the textual stretches that they're translating, but the relationship between the text and the visual material, which uh, is part of what they're delivering. They have to uh, know how to work with technology. They have to uh, be able to work with a very different set of genre uh, from the mm. ones that uh, mm. they worked with 10 years ago. And these are all things that I have tried to take on board and, uh, and are reflected in the second mm. edition. Mm. I think it's an interesting point that you uh, talk about translators being, having to be much more versatile in terms mm. of how they um, approach their work and mm. indeed critically reflect on that mm. work. Uh, and I think one of the things that it has become clearer and clearer as we move on is the constraints that translators are placed under mm. in terms of subtitling constraints, for example, or other uh, types of textual mm. uh, constraints mm. that they, they face. Um, in a way, then, I think the um, approach that you had originally in 1992, a sort of description-based uh, approach rather than a prescription-based mm. approach, is indeed extendable to these kinds of texts, um, yeah. where, for example, a strategy for literary translation uh, in terms of mm. explicitation may be quite different than that in mm. subtitling, for example. Indeed, um, yeah. 
Um, so that kind of covers, if you like, the different kinds of texts that translators face. Are there any other changes uh, to the book itself uh, that you would like to talk about? Yes, so, some of the changes, obviously, the, the types of changes I was talking about are reflected in the range of new genre that are uh, included in both uh, to exemplify strategies to exemplify theoretical notions like collocation, plays on idioms, and also to uh, to include in the exercises at the end of each chapter. So you have things like uh, material from YouTube, uh, videos, for instance, screenshots. We have web pages in the new edition for uh, as exercises to be worked on. Uh, we have material from um, uh, newspaper outlets that are translated regularly into a lot of languages, mm -hmm. like The Economist, mm -hmm. like Cosmopolitan, and so on. Um, other changes that are reflected in, in uh, the new edition include uh, uh, the, the embedding of uh, the text, all the text, yes. in the body of the, of the book itself. So in 1992, because of problems with technology, because we, we weren't as advanced technologically as we are now, I've had to, I had to put a lot of the texts at the end of, uh, of the book, which wasn't very user-friendly, because as people worked with texts or wanted to look at uh, mm. examples, they had to go back to the end of the book to look at Chinese examples or Japanese examples or Arabic examples. Uh, today, because of advances in technology, I've been able to uh, uh, embed these in the body of the text, all of them, so there are no appendices. But Routledge have also done a number of things that have uh, improved the user friendliness mm. of the book. And so, for example, they, uh, uh, many of the examples of uh, particular strategies that are used uh, are, uh, are put in boxes mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so that they are uh, separated from the rest of the text and are much easier to find and work with. The exercises are put in a in, uh, kind of gray area at the end, again, visually. Um, uh, much easier to mm -hmm. work with and mm -hmm. much more user friendly. Um, but uh, other things that I have included here that uh, weren't in the first uh, edition are things like exercises uh, or uh, exemplification with things like comics, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, bringing in the visual and the um, um, and and the uh, verbal material together. Um, and in some places, not many, but in some places, I have tried to also incorpor incorporate material on uh, interpreting because interpreting today is far more important than it was 10 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And the general thinking now is that interpreting and translation are really part of the same discipline. They, there are fewer attempts to keep them separate mm -hmm. uh, today mm -hmm. than, than there were ten, 10 years ago. And so I've tried to incorporate also some material on interpreting where, where that was re relevant and feasible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if we go back to these exercises which have been uh, considerably extended uh, mm. in the second edition, um, do you see these exercises as being something that students would work on on their own as homework mm. exercises or is this something that uh, lecturers could integrate into their t classroom teaching? Mm -hmm. um, they are quite suitable for uh, mixed groups, uh, for people who have mm. different languages. How do you really see these being used mm -hmm. in practice? I think ideally they should be uh, used in teams in the classroom. Uh, of course you can, some of them, or at least some of them, uh, can be used by self-learners on their own. But uh, it's a feature of education in general that people don't, can't learn in a vacuum. You can't learn much by sitting on your own and, and working through uh, material of any kind. Uh, and therefore, these exercises are really ideally suited for working in the classroom and particularly with uh, classrooms that uh, involve students from different cultural and linguistic backgrounds because then you get uh, a better idea of the variation in language use and the issues that vary from one culture to another. Yeah. Yes, and I think also extending this to the kind of multimedia texts uh, that you've been dealing with as yeah. well. Um, for example, taking a very classic uh, notion, uh, text linguistic notion of cohesion, oh and yeah. applying it then to websites uh, in a way that perhaps may be different uh, to the sort of classic verbal um, yeah. textual yeah. analysis that yeah. we've done in the past. And even yeah. in, in, uh, in ordinary textual material like newspaper mm -hmm. articles, for instance, you see that uh, something like cohesion now works quite differently. So yes. uh, people use things like variation in colour to create cohesion, not just verbal material. Yes. And I've tried to incorporate yes. that yes. in the text. Yeah.